Welcome back. We start a bulletin from Turkey which has intensified its air and artillery strikes in northeast Syria as Ankara-backed Syrian forces advanced into the border town of Ras al Ain. Turkey said its forces have captured the town center, but the Kurdish forces say they are countering the action. The Kurdish-led SDF said 45 of its fighters have been killed since Turkey started its offensive in northern Syria on Wednesday. Meanwhile, Turkey said the number of Kurdish and ISIS militants killed in its military operation in Syria has risen to 415. The Defense Ministry has confirmed the death of one Turkish soldier since Operation Peace Spring was launched. It said 14 villages have been liberated from terrorists in northern Syria. Iran has offered to mediate between the Syrian government, the Kurds and Turkey to help secure the Turkish-Syrian border. Foreign Minister Javad Zarif says the Adana agreement between Turkey and Syria is still valid and can help achieve security. The 21-year-old accord requires Damascus to stop harboring the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Ankara says the pact was never implemented. There is an Adana agreement between Turkey and Syria which is still valid. We can help bring together the Syrian Kurds, the Syrian government and Turkey so that the Syrian armed forces can guard the border. Turkey says it will retaliate against any move to thwart its anti-terrorism efforts. The Turkish Foreign Ministry said this in response to Washington's threat to put sanctions on Ankara. U.S. President Donald Trump has authorized the U.S. Treasury Department to draft new sanctions against Turkey. But Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin expressed hope that Washington would not have to enforce the curves on Turkey's economy. He said the punitive measures could target any person associated with the Turkish government. Turkey says its military operation will continue till a 30-kilometer border security zone is established. Moving on, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan will leave for Tehran tomorrow as part of his efforts to help defuse tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. He will also visit Saudi Arabia after meeting with President Hassan Rouhani in Tehran. Earlier, PM Khan said US President Donald Trump and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had both asked him to mediate with Tehran. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said Pakistan wishes to prevent further deterioration in differences between the two Islamic countries. Now, for a deeper take on the story, we're joined from Islamabad by Pakistan's former ambassador to Iran, Mr. Asif Durrani. Thanks for taking time to speak to Indus News, Ambassador Durrani. Now, it's understood that Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan is undertaking the mediation efforts at the request of Saudi and Iranian leadership. Based on your experience, what impact do you expect Khan's efforts to have on reducing tensions in the Gulf? Well, this visit is uh, taking place uh, in the backdrop of uh, uh, recently heightened tensions in the region. And uh, if you compare it with the 2016 uh, uh, peace initiative undertaken by former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and General Rahil Sharif, then, then that too was a problem. Uh, uh, but then uh, uh, Saudi Arabian embassy was burned down in Tehran and uh, Saudis were quite annoyed. But this time what has happened is after Aramco incident, the two uh, countries were almost on the brink of the war. So therefore I think there, is a, uh, there was a need and a realization on both sides that they cannot ratchet up tensions without uh, uh, unless without giving a peace a chance right mr durrani government sources have told indus news that prime minister khan may sh mm, shuttle between tehran and riyadh and back if he receives a positive response in the first round of interaction so do you think saudi arabia and iran have the political will to agree to confidence building measures I think that they uh, don't have a choice uh, unless they give peace a chance. They have been, uh, they have tried uh, several things. They have tried uh, by using the proxies, 
but uh, they have not succeeded. Uh, so uh, in order to succeed, uh, especially giving the peace a chance, it is very important for uh, both the countries uh, to sit together. If they can't uh, sit together face to face, then I think mediation is available. And Pakistan is the right candidate because it enjoys confidence uh, with both. Now, interestingly, in the run-up to Prime Minister Khan's departure, we've seen an apparent missile attack on an Iranian tanker in the Red Sea and a U.S. decision to deploy a, a total of 3,000 troops in Saudi Arabia. So does this suggest to you that tensions could rise further if mediation efforts do not succeed? Yeah, definitely. Therefore, it is very important that... Uh, the mediation efforts uh, should succeed and it's also important upon the parties that they should realize that uh, already say if you look at Saudi Arabia it has lost almost 300 billion dollars during the war uh, with the with the Houthis in the past four and a half years and they are still counting their losses uh, uh, UAE has almost lost 100 billion dollars so uh, it's just a wastage of money it's a wasted uh, wastage of uh, uh, human and material resources uh, and uh, for Iran also uh, the tensions in the region actually uh, has uh, put pressure on Iranian economy so uh, there would be growing uh, discontentment within the, within the people. Right, thank you very much Mr. Asif Durrani, Pakistan's former ambassador to Iran for your time. Now moving on, the Modi administration has barred a press council of Indian delegation from visiting occupied Kashmir. A full member of fact-finding mission was scheduled to start a five-day visit to the valley today. Citing security reasons, the government of Indian occupied Kashmir cancelled the press council's tour at the last moment. The occupied state's information department has asked the press council of India to postpone its delegation's visit till next month. By then, the state government would have relocated from the rest of Srinagar to Jammu for the winter. This contrasts sharply with the Indian government's announcement on Thursday that occupied Kashmir is open to tourists despite the clapdown. India's curfew and communications blackout in occupied Kashmir has now entered its 69th day. The Indian imposed occupied Kashmir state government has burst its own claims of normalcy in the valley with a newspaper advertisement. Asking Kashmiris to resume their usual routines in the ad, the government admits life in the valley is not normal. Advocating for Article 370 revocation ad reads, the people of Kashmir have been misled over the special status. The ad propagates that the people of the valley have decided not to resume their normal lives of their own accord. The propaganda piece has totally ignored the ongoing curfew and communications blackout in the occupied territory. Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees have agreed to take forward a strategy for Afghan refugees repatriation. The agreement was reached at an informal session at Geneva on sidelines of the 70th session of Executive Committee of the High Commissioner's program. In the meeting, the quadripartite decided to remove shortcomings in Afghan refugees' management and their voluntary return. An agreement to form a support platform with additional players was also reached. The session was attended by Pakistan's Minister for Narcotics Control, Shehriyar Afridi, Iran's Interior Minister Abdul Raza Fazli, as well as Afghan Refugees and Repatriation Minister Sayed Hussein Alimi Balkhi and UNHCR Regional Director. A Brexit deal is inside after Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson backed down on the issue of border customs post for Northern Ireland. EU officials say Johnson has indicated that he is prepared to make sufficient concessions to allow detailed talks to begin. More on this report. After months of deadlock, the next 48 hours are expected to be crucial for Britain's exit from the European Union. 
Over this weekend, British negotiators will seek to seal a deal based on a revised draft submitted by Brexit Secretary Steve Barclay. The ice was broken during last-ditch talks on Thursday between the British Prime Minister and Irish leader. At those talks, Johnson performed a U-turn on his insistence that customs posts be established along the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. European Council President Donald Tusk said there were good signs that a deal on Brexit can be reached. Yesterday, when the Irish Taoiseach and the UK Prime Minister met, they both saw, for the first time, a pathway to a deal. I have received promising signals from the Taoiseach that a deal is still possible. Technical talks are taking place in Brussels as we speak. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has refrained from commenting on whether Northern Ireland will leave the EU Customs Union or not. To get a deal done, Johnson must master the complexities of the Irish border before getting the approval of Europe's biggest powers. Uh, let's let our, our negotiators get on. I think where Leo Varadkar and I got to yesterday was a, a joint feeling that there is a way forward. Uh, we can see a pathway to a deal. That doesn't mean it's a done deal, so there's, there's work to be done. The Prime Minister will ask Parliament to back any Brexit deal he secures from the EU within 24 hours of the European summit next week. French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel are set to meet in Paris tomorrow to discuss the Brexit breakthrough. Moving on, North Korea has asked Japan to pay compensation for its fishing boat that sank when it collided with a Japanese patrol vessel earlier this week. North Korea's foreign ministry said the collision was a deliberate act by Japan. In a statement, the ministry said Tokyo will have to face consequences if such incidents occur in future. Pyongyang refuted Japan's claim that the accident occurred after the North Korean boat took a sharp turn. Japanese authorities have said the boat was illegally fishing in their exclusive economic zone. Earlier this week, Japanese Coast Guard rescued 60 North Koreans from a fishing boat. In the United States, three courts have blocked the Trump administration's new immigration rule of prohibiting U.S. visas to low-income immigrants. Judge George Daniels of Southern District of New York has issued a nationwide ban on the public charge rule, calling it repugnant to the American dream. Other Washington and California district judges have also issued similar injunctions. The state of California has banned private prisons and immigration detention centers. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump announced the resignation of Acting Homeland Security Secretary Kevin McAleenan. In New York, four people have been killed in a shooting at an illegal gambling den in Brooklyn. Police say three others were wounded in the incident. They said no one has been arrested over the shooting. Two weapons were recovered from the scene. It's time for a short break. Stay tuned with Indus News. Welcome back. Leaders of indigenous protesters in Ecuador have refused to engage in a dialogue with President Lenin Moreno. In a statement, the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador said there will be no talks until the decree on cancelling fuel subsidies is recalled. The statement said the dialogue offered by the government does not seem trustworthy. Moreno called on protesters to negotiate with the government to cease violence and stabilize the country's political situation. Demonstrators briefly burst through security lines to enter the National Assembly as anger grows over fuel tax and labor reforms. Moreno said the protests are not an outburst of social discontent, but an organized political move to break his government. Meanwhile, protesters have pledged to continue their demonstrations until Moreno steps down. Meanwhile, thousands of people have staged a demonstration in Barcelona on Spain's National Day. The demonstrations were carrying pro-Spain flags and banners. They called for United Spain as the country awaits the Supreme Court's verdict on a trial of 100, uh, I beg your pardon, 12 Catalan separatist leaders. 
they could be sentenced to a maximum of 15 years in prison over their role in the 2017 referendum for independence. The Catalan leaders are facing charges ranging from rebellion to sedition and misuse of public funds. In Japan, a man has been killed and four others injured after Typhoon Haigavis hit the Chiba prefecture near Tokyo. The government has advised a million residents to evacuate the area at risk of floods and landslides. Japan's Met Agency says the heavy winds overturned a car, killing the man inside and blew off the house roofs, injuring the residents. It said more than 16,000 households in Chiba and surroundings have lost electric power. The agency said the storm surges will continue in Pacific coast of Honshu, causing floods and landslides. Hundreds of Extinction Rebellion movement activists have protested in Brussels. Young activists protesting near Royal Palace said they aim to discuss a solution to climate change. The protesters said they want a Belgian king to declare an emergency over climate change. Dutch police arrested 130 climate change protesters who blocked a bridge in central Amsterdam. The protesters slumped on handcocks hung from pillars of the bridge to prevent boats from passing underneath. Police also arrested 80 protesters outside the Rijksmuseum, one of Amsterdam's top tourist draws. In France, hundreds of activists blocked a key route to the National Assembly. They were later dispersed by the police. Much of California has been on high alert since Friday as wind-driven wildfires tore through the state's southern areas. The fires claimed a life for tens of thousands of people to evacuate and destroyed multiple buildings and homes. More in this report. A fierce wind-driven wildfire has swept foothills and canyons along the northern edge of Los Angeles. Authorities have said that the fires are being fueled by dry conditions and high winds known as Santa Ana winds. Several major highways, schools and businesses have been shut down. There is growing panic as people flee from their homes. I really felt frightened, I really felt scared because I'd never seen something like that. Uh, that was my first time to see real fire up close. I've been hearing about it, seeing on the TV, but uh, this was my first time to be really involved in the fire. At least 25 buildings have been destroyed by the blaze so far. Electricity has also been suspended as a safety precaution, and authorities say will only be restored after proper site inspections. Currently, some 200 firefighters, water dropping helicopters, and firefighting airplanes are battling several blazes. People have been instructed to exercise caution. If you stay in a mandated closed area, I we will not assure your safety. That safety is, those areas are established to assure your safety. We need you to honor it. A red flag warning, which indicates ripe conditions for wildfires, remains in effect through Saturday. The first ever person to walk in space, Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, has died at the age of 85. Tethered to a spaceship by a five-meter-long cable, the Russian floated above Earth for 12 minutes in 1965. Leonov was also a celebrated artist who took colored pencils into space to sketch his view of Earth. His drawing of the sun rising behind Earth is considered to be the first actual terrestrial work of art. Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko says Leonov's death is a loss for the whole planet. Yuri Solomko, deputy director of Moscow's Cosmonautics Museum, says Leonov's pioneering spacewalk will never be forgotten. In Pakistan, one family can now boast that five of its members have passed the country's civil services induction exam. All five are sisters. Zoha Malik is the youngest person in the family to pass the Central Superior Service exam. She is among 372 candidates who passed the exam. Zoha's elder sisters are serving in various positions in the government.
In northern India, farmers have started burning crop residue after harvests, adding troubles to the views of New Delhi's residents. Chief Minister Arvind says the smoke has started affecting Delhi's air quality pollution in the Indian capital is already hovering at unhealthy levels. New Delhi was ranked the world's most polluted capital city in 2018. It's time for a short break. Stay tuned with Indus News. It's time for the weather. With the weather update, we come to the end of this bulletin. For more news and updates, keep watching Indus News.